Okay, welcome to my YouTube channel again. Hi, my name is Roland. If this is your first time on my channel, I would like to say welcome and thank you for watching this video. This video is part of my new series called Conversations with Roland, where I bring in interesting folks who have differing views and unique views or unique approaches to life. And I find this very beneficial because I believe today that we all are this unique expressions of the universe having a temporary experience here on earth designed to teach us all how to be infinitely creative and to experience and express this creativity. At the end of the day, it's all information and there are myriad ways in which we can learn more about ourselves. And one of them is actually evolutionary astrology which is a form of astrology, astrology that I just uh, discovered for myself. And I was very lucky to connect with my very next guest, Mr. Brian Coulter, who's uh, talking to me live this evening here in uh, the United States very early in the morning in China. So thank you for doing that, uh -huh. Brian. <laughs> but Brian, thank you for having me. Oh yeah, no, the, actually the pleasure is all mine. Uh, Brian is an evolutionary astrologer. Uh, he started his life out as a poker player, which I find very interesting. And um, in his bio, he mentions a sudden return, which from my understanding is going through a trying experience in his life that led him to start to seek um, alternative methods of feeling better or feeling more purposeful in his life. He read some books, including The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, which is actually one of my favorite books. He studied medical Qigong, reconnected healing, and of course, evolutionary astrology, which is what we're going to talk about here today. So, welcome, Brian. How are you this morning? I'm great, Rowan. Yes, from, live from China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great. The audio sounds great, so I'm loving this. And... Um, with me personally, I like, I love astrology. I've always, I've always read uh, my horoscope, but I've always looked at, you know, Western astrology only. So being born in March, I knew myself as a Pisces man and that was it. And I literally didn't look at anything else. But how, how different is evolutionary astrology from, you know, regular Western astrology or different types of astrology, right? Well, they're very similar. I mean, it does go over personality traits, of course, but I feel what really sets it apart is not only, you know, talking about personality traits, but the desire to transcend the more descriptive forms of astrology into prescriptive. It's like, okay, here's some of your qualities, but, you know, why do you have them, you know? What's the purpose of you being a Pisces, for example? What's your evolutionary path? So we want to look underneath the traits, understand the deep psychology driving those traits into manifestation, but also pinpoint paths of evolution. And really that's what it's all about. And really the, the philosophy underpinning this style, evolutionary astrology, is that we're here to do just that, to evolve. That's a common philosophy that you'll find all over the world. The reason we incarnate here over and over again is to learn, is to mature. So that's what really drove me to learning evolutionary astrology instead of some other styles out there, because I really wanted to answer those questions. It's like, why, you know, why do I have uh, a Sagittarian sun? Which, by the way, is a very Sagittarian question. Why? It's like, what is this all about? You know, and even Pisces asked that to a, a certain degree, because we do share the same uh, planet that rules our, our signs, which is Jupiter. So uh, it was just, it's also another thing that sets it apart in terms of why is, and I know you experienced this with me, was a karmic analysis. I think that's the, the main feature of evolutionary astrology is like, besides pinpointing the paths of evolution, it's also looking at past life circumstances, because in your birth chart, you can look at what are called the nodes of the moon and start to understand karmic dynamics, uh, which led you to this current lifetime. You know, it's like, what's your ongoing unfolding lesson plan? And then how can we take those unlearned lessons from the past life experience and apply them to this lifetime? 
And then of course, what's the remedy? What's the medicine? It's like, how do you balance out the karma and learn the lesson? So I think those are the, the main points that set it apart from other styles. Okay, man. a lot to unpack there, especially for <laughs> someone like me who is <laughs> brand new to um, evolutionary astrology. But I, I, one thing I like about it is really it's focused on the why you are here on Earth during this lifetime. And so mm-hmm. it, when, when you speak that way, it makes me think that um, as an evolutionary astrologer, you have an appreciation for multiple incarnations of the same soul here on Earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it uses the reincarnational model. And there's two different schools of evolutionary astrology, one created by Jeff Green, one created by Stephen Forrest. I'm more in the Stephen Forrest camp, and they do have different approaches to looking at the past life, but that's what they share in common, is they use the reincarnational model. Okay, and that's, that's I mean, I did, uh, for me personally, reincarnation became more of an accepted um, type of, I don't want to say soul activity, more so mm-hmm. after my spiritual awakening. And then, mm-hmm. you know, also looking at uh, some of my p- past lives, right? It, it was weird. I was able to glimpse and see myself in multiple humanoid forms as well as animal forms. I don't know if that sounds really far-fetched, but mm-hmm. that's, that's an experience that I had and I could not... I could not experience that and say, okay, incarnation isn't, or reincarnation isn't part of our evolutionary um, growth, essentially. Um, you also mentioned um, karmic analysis when you're looking at somebody's chart to, to discern why they're here, here on Earth. How, how do evolutionary astrologers view karma? Uh, basically, you're learning lessons from past lives. It's kind of, it's kind of like the law of cause and effect, you know, but put in a, in more multiple lifetimes. It's like what you shall reap, you shall sow, you know, it's kind of like, it'll come back uh, in, in ways to, so that you can balance out the karma. You know, it's the, I guess that's the simplest way of putting it. Okay, great. And then from this, from um, say, uh, um, the creator's point of view is is it is it good or bad you know most people try to t- attach karma as something good versus something bad do you think that ends up being very subjective or is there really a are there two sides to karma or is it essentially a learning process well i don't really look at it as good and bad you know i look at karma very neutrally uh, I think we all make mistakes and we all have, you know, failures and successes in past life uh, circumstances, even in this life. And I look at it very neutrally, you know, it's just uh, paths of learning. So if we do, you know, if we make a mistake, uh, it typically involves doing something that's perceived as bad, either inwardly or from other people. And we either hurt ourselves or other people. And uh, it's just, um, it's, we're here to learn, you know, we're here on planet Earth, a very dense dimension of reality with a stark juxtaposition between light and dark, you know, and what we do with that energy is up to us. So, you know, I, even if somebody does something pretty bad, it, I don't really judge them for it. I usually just think, wow, what did, what lifestyle did they have to lead them to that point, you know, and then recognizing that in the next life, uh, they're going to have to pay some karmic debts and in various ways so I I look at it very neutrally good and bad language I don't really like so much but more light and dark you know the juxtaposition or polarity between you know love and uh, and fear basically that is true in my uh, (laughs) in my in my brand new book uh, you know who and why you are or you need to remember um, I, I discussed that 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 actually was one of the biggest realizations that I had following my awakening was this whole idea of good and bad being entirely subjective and also very temporary depending Mm -hmm. on the goal the person uh, wanted to attain right they would use the same means to attain different ends and at one no at one instant the same um the same means was perceived as good or bad and i just thought if everybody was doing this Right, it, it became very, very difficult to clearly define either one or the other one. And then mm-hmm. another big thing I realized was 
as a unique expression of what I call the universal consciousness, especially here on Earth, you and, and the juxtaposition of both, you know, light and dark, you can't avoid either one. It's it's okay. just impossible, regardless of what you're doing. Every experience is simultaneously both, depending on who is perceiving it and how they they decide to attach, you know, their perception to it. So exactly, it's very yin yang. I mean. Yeah. We're all composed of light and dark. It's like, what do you want to be more on the light side of the force or the dark side of the force, Luke? You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> I mean, it's, that's what we're struck. That's why we're here. That's yeah. why we come down here is to sort these things out, you know, and yeah. play with these energies. Indeed. Which yeah. gives, it, it leads me to the next sort of uh, kind of next question. But so some people have come here multiple times. Um, by my count, with my awakening, this is my sixth time here on earth <laughs> as a human Your sixth tour yeah <laughs> <laughs> my sixth tour which yeah. it kind of explains i i, I don't want to say my awakening was a lot faster but you know it was four years of meditating all self-taught and this happened and it, it almost felt like mm, i've been here and I, I started working on this maybe in a previous life because it happened way too quick um, and this again is a biased perception based off of reading about other people's journeys and experiences and what they had to go through to awaken what do you think the end goal is essentially this is kind of a tough question from an evolutionary astrologer standpoint is why do we keep coming back here and what do we have to look forward to beyond earth essentially well that's the that's the big question you know that's <laughs> That's uh, that's the, the biggest question, probably, uh, and it's tough because it, w whenever us finite little human beings uh, try to conceptualize God, it turns from God to fantasy, right? Because it's, I mean, gosh, it's so otherworldly, uh, higher dimensions. But it sure is fun to think about, you know. Uh, <laughs> as a Pisces, I'm sure you can appreciate that. Um, I don't really know, to be honest. Uh, the thing I keep coming up with is just to grow closer to God, you know, whatever that is, you know, the highest level of consciousness. We kind of, we're working with a scale of consciousness here. And um, if number 1000 of the scale of consciousness, if that's the top of it, if that's God consciousness, you know, Jesus consciousness, whatever, uh, I think we're all striving for that, and as we continually incarnate, uh, maybe I'm a bit optimistic, but I think we're all climbing up that scale of consciousness and becoming more light than dark. And eventually, I think we stop the cycle of needing to incarnate here, and we probably, you know, take on a different role up in the spirit world, you know, as a, maybe a helper or a teacher for others who are doing the same thing here that we've no longer need to do because we've gotten to a certain quantity of light or you know it's like you're using poetry and metaphor here because you know we're trying to de describe something that's indescribable from from our place here on earth but i um, really love the work of uh, michael newton i don't know if you've ever heard of him before but he wrote a book called journey of souls and uh, he was uh, a professional hypnotherapist and he's retired now uh, but back in you know the 60s and 70s, uh, he went to a, a very fancy college, became valedictorian, top of his class, doctor, went on to uh, work at a hospital and lead the psychology wing of some hospital, and that was what he specialized in, was hypnotherapy. And his specialty was to just basically bring people into deep trance and then comb through their lifetime you know, bring them back to their third birthday where he could even describe, the person on the table could even describe what shirt they were wearing on their third birthday, you know, to that level of detail, even though the memory wasn't there in their waking consciousness. So he could comb through their childhood and find, you know, emotional trauma that creates some sort of malady later in life, whether if it's manifested physically or whatever, psychologically. And he found deep clinical value in that. but repeatedly he was so good at this that people that were more open to you know reincarnation would come to him and say please do a past life regression for me and he would you know adamantly refuse i don't see the clinical value in that he was a staunch atheist but then one session he had a client or a patient i guess you could say come to him 
and say, I have chronic left pain along the left side of my body. I've had it for my entire life. I've been through the ringer of Western medicine. All they want to do is drug me up. Still doesn't help. Please help me. And of course, hypnotherapists get these uh, tough cases that come to their doorsteps because it's like, oh, nothing else worked. Let's go to the hypnotherapist. Anyways, he's in deep trance with this person. Many sessions combing through the life can't find the origin of the pain. So in one session, almost out of fresh uh, frustration, Michael Newton says, well, just take me to the origin of your pain. And then the person starts describing this past life where they were in World War I and they got bayoneted all along the left side of their body. And then he's kind of stumped, stunned, you know, listening to this session. And, uh, but after the session, the pain dissolved, completely gone. A lifelong ma malady. Uh, was no longer and then he's like well there's clinical value in this so then he started researching it and he actually found out that he could regress people not only to their past life experiences but to the spirit world and this is why i love his books uh, journey of souls destiny of souls because he has a very thorough like five or six thousand persons case study of basically everybody describing the same place Wow. through their own lens of their subconscious so a little bit different languaging mm -hmm. but they're all describing the spirit world and it and it he asks them questions just like this why are we here what is it all about what are we trying to achieve so when i say you know oh ultimately it's kind of a long-winded answer here but ultimately i think we're just meant to climb the scale of consciousness and then maybe eventually we take on another role in the spirit world you know, a lot of the information that I believe to be truth is from those books, because I find it to be scientific evidence uh, for higher dimensions of reality, which just, when I read that book, I read that book right around when I read Power of Now with Eckhart Tolle, and both those books uh, were, you know, blew my doors of perception right over, uh, right open, and uh, allowed me to hang my hat on some sort of belief system, so. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I, I definitely will check the book out, Journey of Souls by Michael Newton. Um, Eckhart Tolle's book is also amazing. That book actually ended up in my hands as part of what I call a universal miracle. It's a book. Yeah, I, yeah, I wanted to read that book for over three years, but I never, ever bought it. And one day before going to work, it showed up um, behind my car. <laughs> Oh wow! I'm not kidding. That's a it's actually wow. a very interesting story for maybe another episode. But yeah, it just ended up behind my car, and I had started writing my book at the time, so I, I picked it up in very good condition, uh, paperback. Opened up just a random page, read it, and was immediately in disbelief of how um, much the words you know touched me in that moment, and how much they sort of confirmed or revalidated what I had learned and had begun to write in my book after my awakening. So I took the book to my office and left it there because I didn't want it to influence uh, my writing as much. So <laughs> it was only after I got into a very good, uh, um, sort of a, a good spot in my writing that I picked up the book again. But Michael Newton's book sounds amazing too, and I definitely would check it out. I, I, there's no... No way I'm going to hear this and then uh, sort of prevent myself from expanding my own knowledge by not reading this book. After. Well, if you don't read it, it'll just end up behind your car. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> by the way, Brian, you can connect with him on uh, briancota.com as well as Facebook and Instagram at Brian Cota Astrology. He also has a YouTube channel where he posts um, some very beautiful astrology videos and they're they're super unique unlike every other astrologers that um, astrologers videos that i have seen because you don't focus on signs as much as you do on the placement of the moon or where the moon is transitioning either during a full moon or um, a new moon and in what sign and that's that's another thing i found super unique and do you mind speaking some more about that yeah, I have a soft spot in my heart for the moon, and that's actually a good segue to the moon because it represents the heart, it represents the soul in your emotional world. But, you know, mainstream astrology, the horoscopes of the world are a beautiful thing, but they're kind of a double-edged sword. The good news is, is most people know what astrology is because of horoscopes. 
the bad side of that is it, 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 it generalizes basically. It can't help but be somewhat superficial because it's only describing astrology through one of the planets, the sun. Granted, it's central. The sun is the center of everything. So it's going to resonate with people on a very deep level. But still, you know, we have 10 things we're calling planets here. You know, the, the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and now to Pluto, if you use the 10 planet system. So the Moon is equally as important as the Sun. The Sun is the center of your head. You know, that's what it represents, the astrological sun, your identity, your sanity, your vitality. Again, very central to our evolution and our and our psyches. But the moon is the center of your chest. It's your heart and your soul and your emotional world. So I do pay close attention to the rotations of the moon, especially new moons and full moons, because I want to understand, you know, it's two points in every month, the new moon and the full moon. So it's a good way to keep our fingerprints to the braille, so to speak, of the astrological weather. So, and by the way, just so people know, my name's my my name Brian is spelled with a Y, oh, yeah. and Coulter is spelled C O L T E R. So if somebody tries to look the normal way of spelling Brian, they may have trouble finding me. Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> No, that's a beautiful clarification. And I will have links to your website, your Facebook page, Instagram, all of that at the bottom of this interview here on YouTube. So feel free to check and connect with them. I actually encourage you to do it. Um, and I'm, I'm a little biased here, but I'm speaking from experience and usually experience is your best teacher. And um, when people use a service and advertise it, you know that it's at least from there you can take your word. And this is actually a, a good segue, Brian, if you don't mind. In t If you want to briefly discuss the different aspects of how the planets in evolutionary astrology affect um, the individual, like when you're looking at a chart. You've, you've mentioned your affinity for the moon already, but what about the other planets and what role do they play in, um, in helping, right? In helping, say, the individual whose chart you're looking at better understand themselves and you know help you also sort of prescribe the lessons and your path in this life for them yeah so it really depends on if you're looking at the birth chart of somebody or if you're looking at the current astrological weather because the meanings of the planets will kind of shift uh, the astrological weather is more the ongoing unfolding lesson plan or evolutionary state whereas the birth chart is more of a description of, you know, cradle to grave paths of evolution, you know, and inner psychology. I actually call the blueprint, the or the, the birth chart, the blueprint of the psyche. So it depends on what you're looking at. Um, and the birth chart is really boilerplate. If anybody's interested in understanding astrology, you always want to start with your own personal birth chart. And in terms of the birth chart, yes, the sun is the basically your ego, but not in the negative sense of the word. Uh, your vitality, your sanity, your self-image, uh, your values. The, the moon is your emotional world. And then the rest of the planets have, you can kind of think of them as voices in your head. Not that, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, voices in the head, but different perspectives, different needs of the psyche. So, for example, where Mars is in the chart, generally speaking, uh, is where you want to sharpen your will and develop your courage. And that's the evolutionary path of Mars for anybody. And depending on what sign it is in or what house it is in, it'll put, it'll aim our noses in the right direction in terms of where in your life you need to develop more courage. Uh, Mercury is represents more the mind perception, communication, and language. Of course, our, our speech template and different things that, that, that applies to that, again, depending on what sign and house it's in. And then Venus is our relationship needs. You know, Venus is the goddess of love. You know, we can't ever forget about that. We're social creatures, so Venus is very important in astrology. And then Saturn, wherever it exists in the chart, represents a few different things. One is the blockage you know Saturn's known as the great malefic in astrology so wherever it is in the chart really wants uh, some blood sweat and tears on your part to really bust through that blockage it's a major 
it represents a major uh, evolutionary path for you. Because if you're blocked there, it stands to reason that you need to grow there. But Saturn makes it a little bit more difficult, a little bit more tough, because it wants you to accomplish a great work in the world. And that great work is really encompassed in your entire birth chart. But here is the planet Saturn, which is kind of a, a reality checkish planet. It says, if you want this great work, if you want this great prize in your life, you're going to have have to earn it you know that's that's the role of Saturn yeah yeah and then Jupiter is kind of the well go ahead no sorry go ahead and go ahead and talk about Jupiter and I'll come back to Saturn oh, again sure so Jupiter is kind of uh, di much different almost an opposite to Saturn in the sense of it's the king of the gods it's the planet of luck and expansion so Saturn can sometimes be seen as unlucky although I don't really see it that way, but it can be described that way. And then Saturn can be seen as more auspicious, where the toast will land butter side up, you know, 67% of the time. You know, it's, it seems to be, it's, it's, uh, it's a planet of expansion and uh, bringing you, it kind of re reminds me of Santa Claus in a way. Here comes Santa Claus. So wherever it is in your birth chart represents a gift from the gods that you have, a natural skill set. Uh, but the challenge of that is glossing over it or not realizing it's there. You know, it's like Jupiter always wants you to press yourself because it's the planet of faith. And Jupiter says, I want you to have more faith in yourself than you currently have. So asking Jupiter questions like, how am I underestimating myself is a really good Jupiter question because you have a gift there, a present for you to unpack. So wherever it is in the chart, you know, house and sign will you know, make it more detailed, more specific to your own journey in this lifetime. And then Uranus is the planet of individuation. So where are you to more individualize in your life, which is to say, it's kind of a fancy word, become a truer version of yourself. So depending on sign and house, that's the direction where you will basically become more of your divine essence, I guess you could say, because we're really a combination of essence and training, you know. We're all born into a family and a culture, and we're all brainwashed to a certain extent. So a lot of what we know in our personality is learned behavior, what we mimicked. And then a big part of our personality is our soul, you know, the part of our personality that's been evolving over many, many lifetimes. So the process of individuation is basically shedding some of that learned behavior so that you can shine more of your true essence and that's the process uranus represents in your birth chart and then uh, neptune is rules pisces you know it's a planet that you have a strong affinity with uh, it's neptune's the god of the sea which is a metaphor for the sea of consciousness it's a very mystical metaphysical planet so if you want to spiritually evolve you know we look closely to where it is in your birth chart and then Pluto represents basically psychological wounding and then the process of healing that wound. That's why it's called the planet of transformation. So we look to where wounding is likely to uh, exist in your life based on where it is in the birth chart and then methods of healing that wound. Again, we always want to transcend the descriptive form of astrology into prescriptive. It's like, great, you have all these planets, why, what can we do with it? How can we make this practical in your life with the goal being to put your personal growth and evolution into hyperdrive, you know? And if that's why we're here, like we've been discussing, you know, it becomes uh, very important information. And this is one system of many that can some glean some insights in that regard. No, that's great. Oh. Yeah, that was a lot of information, but... <laughs> no, but it's all great information. And um, I actually like the way you ended it by saying it's one piece of information. It's one tool, again, that's available yeah. to anybody that's willing to grow, grow or evolve while they're here on Earth. And I've always found beliefs to be, let me not say always, more so after my awakening, I found beliefs to be interesting in that, you know, they help keep you safe while you experience life, in, while you are experiencing life on earth, but they also limit you. And I say this because, you know, I, <laughs> I'm i trying to picture a family member or a friend or someone who could care less about astrology that maybe stumbled upon this video and then probably thought, 
oh my goodness, this is all hogwash. Um, Thumbs down. Yeah. (laughs) Right? Like, this is nothing. And I just think, no, I mean, you can find value in just about anything that you expose yourself to. And you don't have to believe anything. But if you can use that to better yourself, improve your growth, I'm all for it. I really am. And that's part of why I'm having these conversations with folks like you, Brian. So thanks for sharing. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yeah. With, the, with all the planets you talked about, there are two I want to focus on. Um, one of them, of course, is, is Saturn. And if you can talk more about the Saturn return, right? Sort of like uh, uh, what that does and why that's so crucial to your uh, life here on Earth when it comes back. Yes. Yeah, the Saturn return is major in everybody's life. And we usually have two of them in our life, right around the ages of 28 to 30, somewhere in there. Uh, depends on when you were born because of the, of the orbit of Saturn. And it lasts for about a year, give or take a couple months. And we have it uh, then 28 to 30. And then again, um, you know, later in life, around 56 to 58, somewhere in there. And really, it, and this is, by the way, it's a Saturn return, for those who don't know, is when Saturn, the planet Saturn, returns to the point in the sky where it was when you were born. That's a Saturn return. And it represents, at least the first Saturn return, the pivot point between youth and midlife. Now, you know, if you're 26, describing a 26-year-old as youthful, you know, I, you know, it's some people may disagree with that. But I know when I was 26, I was youthful. I didn't know anything. Uh, so, it, it, you know, as I said, Saturn is a reality checkish planet. So here it comes, rolls around to its own birth chart position, and it's time for a reality check. You know, basically what that means, and that's the pivot point between youth and midlife, and. It's the bringer of change, basically. That's the way I see it anyways. And whatever in your life up to that point is no longer serving you tends to dissolve out of your life. Maybe gracefully, maybe not so gracefully. Saturn times are usually bumpy roads. And the general advice I give for people going through a Saturn return is don't resist change. It's going to happen. People who really suffer during Saturn returns are the ones that just, you know, dig their fingernails into the ground, kicking and screaming, resisting the change. Because a lot of us humans, myself included, of course, uh, don't like change too much, you know, some more so than others. But that's why Saturn can classically be a bumpy road. But ultimately, it's for our maturation. That's a key Saturn word. And for our betterment. It's like a course correction. It's like the Lord Saturn saying, you know, shifting you, shifting the direction in which you're heading and saying, this is, this is your destiny this way. And whatever is serving you, not serving you, is going to just fall by the wayside. And whatever is more in alignment with what you need to accomplish in your midlife will come to you during this life. And I know during my Saturn return, it was a major pivot point. It was like a 180 degree spin. So I don't know if you want me to share my own personal story. Yes, please do, of course. (laughs) So, uh, oh, you mentioned that um, I was a poker player. Yes. So, yes, in my 20s, I, even before that, I was an IT guy. I had my own computer business, which is very cerebral, very cognitive. And then eventually I gave up the computer business to play professional poker online because during my computer business days, I would work on computers all night and I, I became very, I'm a numbers guy, you know, uh, and even astrology is very mathematical. But I, I, I took poker on as a hobby because I was also very competitive then. And it was a way where I could be competitive, use numbers, which I really enjoyed, like uh, probabilities and stuff like this, and make money at it. And it turned hobby into a profession because I was making <laughs> making good money at it. And I was like, well, this computer stuff's really stressful. You know, I'm shaving years off my life here, uh, to put it dramatically. And of course, poker is even more stressful as I ended up to find out. But uh, it was more fun and I had much more freedom. I could go anywhere I wanted to and play poker. 
Uh, but it was a very self-serving lifestyle. And even then, I knew that. And um, throughout my 20s, I was very, I had an addictive personality. And really the addictions were rooted in personal pain from childhood, as usual. And um, come the Saturn return, the Saturn came and said, this is not serving you in your direction. Here, I'm gonna violently push you in this direction. And at that time, uh, online poker was legal in the United States. And then it became illegal. A very lavish lifestyle to no longer able to do it right as my Saturn return hit. And thankfully, at that point, I didn't play the victim card of what was me. Sure, it rattled my chain. It's like, oh my God, I gotta figure out how to pay the bills this month <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> because not only, you know, it's like they froze my money too in the poker account. So I immediately looked for jobs. I started doing computer work again. Um, but I needed, I was in a rather expensive studio apartment at the time and I needed to pay the bills. So I needed a nighttime part-time job to fill kind of the, the slot of time where I needed to make some extra income. So I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna, uh, I wanted to work a Whole Foods market because during the Saturday return, I started to become more health oriented, started to read Power of Now. That's right when I sobered up basically. And I said, the first job that comes up with Whole Foods market, I'm gonna take it. And lo and behold, the one that fit the nighttime slot part-time was a dishwasher. Yeah. <laughs> so I went from a poker player, professional poker player, to a dishwasher within a couple of weeks, right as my Saturn return hit. And gosh, it was, it was some humble pie. But it set me in a direction to where I'm at now. You know, where I became, I sobered up, as I said, I, I grew a voracious appetite for spirituality. I guess you could say I had a spiritual awaken, and that's when I read Journey of Souls, and it's like, oh my God, you know, a whole new world. In the clarity of mind of being sober, I realized that my addic addictive tendencies in my 20s, my, my vice, one of them was smoking pot, uh, was rooted in emotional pain, as I said. And then with the clarity of mind, I then focused all of my energies on healing, basically. And, you know, went, got into Qigong, as you said, and reconnective healing and became very interested in psychology and the Myers-Briggs personality test and all these things so I could learn more about myself, my own path, and then all these different mo modalities to help me heal from this, this core wound, this very Plutonian wound that was stemmed from childhood, from family. And of course, my Pluto's in the fourth house of family in my birth chart. So that fits very strongly there for me. Um, and that journey of self-healing led me eventually to astrology and studying with Stephen Forrest. And I, over that, I don't know, six or seven year period of time beyond the Saturn return, I learned so much and I figured, and it's of course a lifetime of learning, but I wanted to, to help people with the knowledge that I learned. So here I am. Uh, turning it outward on the world through this medium that I enjoy, which is astrology. The energetic stuff, the Qigong, I really love too, but I find that, you know, clients would come in, they'd lay on the table, I'd shower them with good juju, they'd feel great, you know, but there was no talking, you know, I needed like some counseling aspect. So that's, I think the main reason, at least one of them that I was drawn to astrology, because I could sit with people and talk with them and talk about real issues in their life and how we can uh, apply the, the symbols to their journey. Ah, no, thanks for sharing. That's a beautiful story. Um, nothing wrong with being a dishwasher. That was my first job in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed it, actually. It was a good workout, especially in the Whole Foods Deli. It's like, you know. Yeah, I actually, dump I, not to cut you off, but I love doing dishes. I actually have a YouTube video out where I talk about um, in, I, I talk about meditation a lot. That's my go-to for everything. It's meditating. And um, the video is kind of a, a, a prescription to help folks take your meditation to the next level by mm -hmm. taking care of your chores right now. And so the whole idea is you don't want to sit to meditate and be reminded of needing to do the dishes or, you know, 
taking out the garbage, etc. So you want to take care of everything so that when you sit to meditate, it's actually a healing time, not a, a time to remind you of how irresponsible you are. <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah, and in there, I, I share it with the world that I actually enjoy doing dishes. It's therapeutic mm. to me. I sit there and I can think and clean, but... It can be very meditative. It can. I, I still just about every moment I can to meditate, so... I guess I'm a little biased there too, but I love. Oh, you are a Pisces. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I that I am for sure. And before we go into um, how your conversations with folks can really help them um, take the, you know the the learning about who they've been in your past lives and what kind of lessons they've chosen to come here and learn in this time and how to apply that. Can you focus more on Pluto, please, um, the planet Pluto and how it affects us? I say that because in my reading, which you did, thank you very much, which, by the way, if you haven't had an evolutionary astrologer um, look at your birth chart, you should. It's an entirely different experience. I, I didn't know what to expect. I was blown away, very fascinated. And, and again, I was kind of, I guess I had, you know, <laughs> an idea of, okay, it's going to talk about your Pisces, Pisces, Pisces. That was like the list of <laughs> the message that I got from my reading. Mine was mostly really focused on Pluto and where it was um, mm -hmm. and, and the North Node. That's also new to me. So if you don't mind sharing, again, the importance of Pluto in evolutionary astrology, um, or maybe it's more so the importance of the North Node than it is the actual planet. But mm. maybe you can answer that for me. Yeah, had I done a birth chart reading for you, I would have talked about Pisces very much in depth, you know, because you are very Piscean. Uh, but with the reading I gave you, it was a karmic analysis or past life reading. So with that, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with that, it's very specific. It looks at what are called the nodes of the moon in your birth chart, the south node and the north node, and they're directly opposite of one another. And the south node represents past, it represents habit, sort of been there, done that energy, and in, in this case, past lives. And then the north node is the polarity point. It's the point of balance. So if, you know, been there, done that is south node, the north node is nothing but a good idea. It's opposite from where you've come from. It's foreign, it's very exotic, feels unnatural. It's kind of like brushing your teeth with your left hand if you're right-handed. So therefore, the North Node becomes a compelling point in your birth chart. I call it the point of enlightenment. Now, if you master your North Node, I'm not saying you'll sprout angel wings and ascend, you know, uh, although that's the goal. It, I mean, you might, depends on where you're at in your spiritual journey. But more likely, though, you master your North Node, you get an A-plus in this incarnation, so to speak. You graduate and move on to the next lesson. Because, you know, this is a bit of a K-12 through 12 here on planet Earth, and I, I do believe we're, we're working through lesson plans, so to speak. And again, that's very much talked about in the book Journey of Souls. But yes, the North Node is, is that polarity point. And since we all suck at our North Nodes because it's so foreign, uh, there's going to be major stumbling blocks and it will take relentless effort. But we can all do it, you know. Uh, we can turn those stumbling blocks into stepping stones towards a raising of our consciousness. It just becomes difficult to do so. Uh, now, I, the reason I talked about Pluto so much in your past life story is because it's very central to it, because it's right next to your south node of the moon, your south node's in Scorpio. Pluto is the planet that rules Scorpio. So not only do you have Pluto next to your south node, but it's in its own sign. So it's effectively supercharged in your chart. Uh, and this is why a full understanding of your birth chart is so important. You read the horoscopes of the world and all you think is Pisces, 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 right? Mm -hmm. But it's so much deeper than that. And little did you know, you know, Pluto played a massive role in your past life story. I don't remember the exact reading I was you know, a couple months ago, yeah. but you know, I can tell just by it being next to your south node that uh, there's deep psychological and emotional wounding, since that's what Pluto represents in your past life story. I don't know if you want to share it or whatever. Again, I don't remember the details. Oh, no, I don't mind sharing it. We and yeah. it ended up being about you know losing either myself, loved ones, or family members, and it talked about 
coming from West Africa, kind of like slavery. Maybe I was, you know, uh, ended up being a slave in my past life, which uh-huh. I would not be, it would not be surprising to me, actually. Um, and and I say that because in my awakening, the the, the full-blown one that I had at, at Rhythmia, right, I was able to see um, um, sort of my past life, body suits or human human Mm. self and how i evolved Mm. and it was always always um right in in sort of african in a sense like i've always been like from west africa i didn't have any other sort of uh, a human body that i would associate with coming from either europe or maybe even the united Mm. states or South America, anywhere else, it always every single one of the faces looked very much um, like originating from West Africa. So, in my past life, if I was here, kind of resonated. Now, I have not done any past life regressions to to go mm. back and see, um, mm-hmm. but I, I found it. I found it. No, I found the the reading certainly fascinating, and it did touch home. And another thing you talked about was my. Um, um, fascination with sort of psychology in a way or got an A plus in psychology. Yes, yes, yes. Man, yes. That, <laughs> that, that resonated so much because I've always been fascinated with human behavior and yeah. understanding how um, kind of comical humans are in, in their decision making. Sure. And they don't look at <laughs> so that's oh, yeah. not really beautiful. And then the North Node piece hit home and, um, really, really well for me because it talked about oh you mentioned healing which is really what I'm working on now especially since after my Saturn returned and I was like man you gotta, you gotta leave mm. your job I went deep into meditating had this awakening and now you know doing Reiki for folks on myself awesome. um, and then you know having these conversations to help people heal and a lot of my healing is really saying like you have to it's like facilitating folks where you have to work on yourself at the end of the day there's only so much um, anybody can do we all have healing to do but some of us can you know lend a helping hand um, but sort of empowering yourself to say hey man those answers are within Mm -hmm. and my go-to is meditating and I like to supplement it with just about anything and everything else right that's you know not traditional at a religion which is still good as well if it works for you for sure go for it um, but astrology is nice meditating is nice qigong is super nice um reiki as well and you know i say all this and i'm the pharmacy director at a hospital so sometimes mm. western medicine is also very interesting which um, mm-hmm. which uh, i say if it works for you then then do it you absolutely know, yeah they're all tools you know that's that's what I was saying about astrology. It's just one tool of many, you know, and uh, yeah. and it helps us along our journey. It really does. Um, and, and speaking of, you know, being on Earth as sort of K to twelve, you realize that depending on what grade you're in and what lessons you chose to learn, some of these tools might not work for you. Hmm. Um, and I don't know. You can maybe speak more to this. But I wonder if, after you come in, right, before your first Saturn return, a lot of your life, your experiences, your perceptions, your beliefs aren't really your own. It's, right. A lot of it's going to be what your environment, your parents have, uh, you use the word brainwashed, but sort of made you <laughs> believe, right? Yeah. yeah. And I wonder if the Saturn return is, is kind of like the first one to say, okay, this is who you think you are and these are the lessons you think you came here to learn. But all right, now it's really time to to wake up and say, hey, hold on. Um, see past this um, sort of uh, conditioning and come into your own. And to do that, you literally have to let go of, of these conditionings that you have um, sort of accepted Mm -hmm. and 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 this is the path you have to take which is it can be scary but like you said it's easier if you don't fight it do you find that that's the case or maybe not yeah it's the planet of maturation you know and it kind of knocks you upside the head sometimes Uh, but it's better it's much better to uh, adopt and go with the flow 
sort of energy with Saturn. It's like, okay, They're almost like surrendering, you know, to the process and having faith that the direction in which you're being led is for your optimum potential, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, it's, yeah, it's all about maturing and a big process of that maturing is, I mean, you come to the Saturn return and you've kind of outgrown yourself. So you're kind of catching up with yourself, kind of an interesting way of putting it. But yes, uh, the process of maturing in part is finding out who the heck you are, you know, and Saturn comes around and causes havoc in your life oftentimes, uh, at least in the Saturn return. And it's showing you what's not serving you. It's like, maybe, you know, it's classic, classic for Saturn returns for people to either get married or to get divorced or to have a child, you know, something like this, or get a new job or leave a job, uh, you know, in, in your case, it had to deal with a job, right? Yes. Uh, and that's yeah. interesting that you said mine was, in no did you say November, 2015? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. 2015, this, 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the, you're the first one to tell me when my Saturn return came back, but I know exactly what happened in November, 2015. Uh, mm. It had been a year, uh, one year that I started meditating and I had just graduated from business school. I was mm. working in Nashville, Tennessee, and I quit my job in November because I just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I quit my job and um, I, I, I just, I knew that, well, when I quit it, I didn't have a job lined up and I was thinking of moving to Germany to meet my, my current, or my wife now, who was then my girlfriend. I mm -hmm. I'm just going to quit my job and something is going to, I felt very, very sure that something was going to come of me quitting my job um mm. nothing was lined up i just i just knew that i couldn't continue working where it was and i took mm. some yeah, and i flew, i went to cameroon for a cousin's wedding visited germany and then um ended up landing this job about five months later which is the job i'm currently in yeah and <laughs> and i mean it's not to sound cliche um, or to say there's anything wrong with it but you know when 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 you do that the advice from your family and friends and loved ones is that's not a good idea don't quit or you don't have another job of course yeah uh, but for some reason it just felt right i i, I don't mm. know why i just said i can't i just have to quit i quit my job and it was scary of course but it just felt confident in a way <laughs> i don't know i don't advise that for people i have <laughs> Yeah, that it was my dad in return. It yeah. just it just felt yeah. like it and I did it, took a leap of faith. And today I'm talking with Brian Coulter. What do you Well the, you're Pisces, so you know, Pisces is very go with the flow, you know, it's a very mutable sign. And so it was my sign, Sagittarius, my sun sign. So I think for me, although it was definitely rocked my world, I was almost hungry for change at that point. Uh, um, so mutable signs tend to navigate Saturn returns a little bit better, I find, at least through personal experience, because of that go with the flow energy. You know, it's like, yeah, uh, parents and whatnot or whoever is like, don't do that because it's not the practical thing. You know, it doesn't, that certain life circumstance doesn't seem reasonable. Yeah, but Pisces also deals with intuition. So it's almost like you were listening to your angels, so to speak. And you had faith in that. And that's a higher octave expression of Pisces. You know, the, the devil's version of your chart is basically the chart of an addict, you know, because uh, it's the high end of Pisces. The 12th sign is basically a spiritual evolution, enlightenment, a dedication to meditation, because you have, let's say, a, a heightened level of psychic sensitivity and it can go in that direction but if you don't go in that direction uh and you get overwhelmed by your own level of psychic sensitivity it can be led to addictive behavior especially when it's in the fifth house of your chart like it is for you because it's the house of fun the house of pleasure that's one big component of it um so it's like is it a uh, spirit or spirits is kind of the <laughs> in question and yeah. there's a stark juxtaposition you play for high stakes in this lifetime by virtue of being so piscean especially armed with this deep plutonian psychological wounding from past life experience so uh you know we can see 
where you the direction you led in your life uh, is kind of like a Bravo thing. You know, your angels were popping expensive champagne when you decided to quit your job and, and go to be with your uh, your girlfriend at the time because they knew it put you on a particular track, a particular path to deepen your relationship with your own inner journey through meditation and spirituality and psychology and all that, you know. So it's definitely a higher expression of, of your birth chart, I find. Well, thank you. And I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, actually, just because of um, what happened ever since, including the awakening and the path that I'm on now. Um, it feels, I call it bliss, to where mm-hmm. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm just so okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Great. know. It, it feels very yeah, relaxing, yes. like very, yeah. And I mean, Writing a book was one of it. I had no idea I could ever write a book. But it's all stemming from being a chronic meditator, like, you know, addicted to meditating. And I, I just love it. I do it every day. If I'm not spending time with my wife or at work, I'm meditating. Yeah. Sometimes Beautiful. she thinks I do it too much anyway. So. Beautiful. Yes. Meditation. Right. <clears throat> um, one more thing. So in sure. if you have say a chart reading with somebody how does that how can they use that information to actually make practical changes in their lives is is usually you know like how does knowing that this is what i'm here to do actually Mm. help them you know does it Mm. empower them to do it or sometimes you think just having the information is good enough well first of all the information has to resonate with them and thankfully through my work i haven't had any complaints in that regard so usually Astrology is a gentle of a gentle reminder of the things we've always known about ourselves. Because in the chaos of living here on planet Earth, you know, the school of hard knocks, people aren't always perfectly nice to each other down here, you know, as I'm sure you've noticed. Uh, it's and also it's just a very chaotic environment. It's so easy to lose track of ourselves. We all have a pretty good idea of who we are to varying degrees but when this outside system sitting with an astrologer who knows nothing about you personally and here they are reading your blueprint of the psyche and all you start to connect all these dots you start thinking about your past your history and your natural inclinations and your passions and whatever and you're like oh my god and it's kind of mind-blowing and by redirecting our consciousness on what we already knew was important about ourselves on those things helps to focalize our superpower of human humanity which is focused intent focused uh, you know consciousness on those aspects of ourselves just gives us a little alignment you know if we we all get thrown off track you know to varying degrees at different points in our lives so it can just whoop, put you know put us back on track and then uh, keep our consciousness on those aspects of ourselves to help to cultivate them and to grow them even more. And the more we do that, we find that our life just changes and be- we become more in line with our destiny, so to speak, and we can be back on the path of self-actualization, which basically means you know, your fullest potential. And that's why I like astrology, is it just it's that reminder of of what we already knew yeah no it really is it and it is a, i like the word reminder um, <laughs> not to plug my book again but the my book is it's titled who and why you are all you need to remember and mm. uh, i the word reminder or remember really resonates with me because after the awakening it did feel like i was discovering new information that i never knew it, mm-hmm. it literally was a reminder and um, a lot of it were just um, aha moments like oh man right oh crap like that's what's going on uh, I knew this and I forgot so here we go okay thanks for the reminder so, yep. no thank you so much it can be very confirming yeah very confirming and uh, that confirmation is can be motivational as well it's like and it also, another beautiful thing I like about it is it can help us to lighten up on ourselves, you know, and other people. Yeah. Like, oh, it's like, oh, 
I am weird, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, it's just that, it's like, it's so simple. It's like, oh, it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay that I'm weird, you know? I'm being silly. That's kind of what I thought about myself when, because my birth chart does speak to a lot of strangeness. Yeah. I mean, I'm an astrologer after all. But it's like, oh, it helps us to develop more compassion for ourselves and more compassion for other people sometimes. Because it's like, oh, we're all so different. You know, sometimes at least, and this is a part of being immature, I guess, through my 20s, I confused, you know, my own perception of reality with everybody else's. Like, oh, shouldn't everybody think like me, you know? And then if they don't, I get into this judgment maybe, or, you know, it's... So studying any of these systems like Myers-Briggs or all these different personality types, astrology, numerology, whatever, throw all these archetypes, we realize that we're all playing with these archetypes and some archetypes are more emphasized in people's psyches than others. And we're all so specific and nuanced and that's kind of like a duh thing, you know? (laughs) Shouldn't you know that? But astrology can just remind us of that. And then in turn, we have that you know, we lighten up a little bit, whether it's on ourselves or with other people. Indeed. I mean, I I have come to appreciate the diversity, right? And and sort of the nuances of um, how unique each and every single one of us is. And I found out to be um, sort of why we are. Like if we weren't so diverse, creativity would be flat. Yes. And, and and I think that's why we're here. We're here to express, experience creativity in an infinite number of ways, including mm-hmm. Ryan Coulter, an astrologer. Like that, I, that's fascinating. If if everybody were me, well, <laughs> I, I don't know what planet Earth would be like. Everybody would just <laughs> creativity would be flat. And and, and yeah. yeah, and um, and I think consciousness which is what i call the creator appreciates that it continues to exist because of um because it allows unique expressions of itself to to express creativity based off of what it knows and what it experiences and what it likes so oh man couldn't agree more yeah we we are right around an hour of conversating here brian and we don't want to talk people's heads off i could literally talk to you for um another hour or so but we are quest. yeah and so again if you want to connect with brian he's at briancoulter.com he's on facebook and instagram at brian Coulter astrology he also has a beautiful youtube channel where he posts videos about um of the moon regularly i just just watched mm-hmm. the recent one beautiful information to to help you i guess understand yourself better which can be relaxing and empowering and i absolutely love it and um brian if there's one thing you want folks to to appreciate more about evolutionary astrology what would you like to tell them about evolutionary astrology well we covered it pretty thoroughly i think that um You know, it's just one tool of many out there that can help us to evolve, to learn, to grow. And, you know, if that's the reason we're here, uh, it becomes a valuable source of information for us. You know, not only for the inspiration, the compassion, the motivation, all that, but just, you know, giving us some clarity about our direction in life and that direction in life if it's in alignment with your soul's intention is the path of evolution and uh and of growth and if that's why we're here you know that's uh it's a beautiful thing to learn more about it if we can accelerate that process I, you know i find it to be like some of the most <laughs> important information we can glean from any system indeed yeah well, thank you so much again um guys thanks for listening to brian and me conversate here if you find any value in this please like comment share the video um again don't forget to connect with brian i think his karmic life chart readings are 72 dollars right now and there's a link on his instagram page that you can click on i encourage you to uh to pay for it and, and get your reading they're actually 
they're life changing. They're different.、Uh, it's like no reading I've ever had before,、um, and it was a, a nice、um, discussion, I guess, or just a nice,、uh, this, yeah, a nice discussion about what my past, my past life might have been, which I, I didn't think much of、um, at all. So. You can also connect with me, Roland, on Instagram at awake underscore ra.、Um, if you sign up and join my mailing list, you get a free 43 page guide to help you effectively meditate or begin an effective meditating practice. And don't forget to get your hands on a copy of Who and Why You Are All You Need to Remember, now available on Amazon, also through my website if you want an autographed copy. And then、uh, I promised. Brian, I was going to check out Michael Newton's new book, Journey of Souls.、Mm. Nice. Love to hear. Yeah,、we'll、just read it. And thank you so much again, Brian, for for your time early this morning, talking to me from China. I appreciate it very much. My pleasure. It was fun. Thank you, Roland. <laughs>